we have a real treat for you today to our conversation with one of the leading financial gurus who's an insider for the whole system that is going to give us her wisdom. And I think that's probably the most accurate word on a wide variety of topics, ranging on on, uh, her views on how do you identify a good bank and develop a relationship with relationship with them. It actually uh, goes into great detail. And then we talk about the in, the likelihood of the internet coming down and some strategies we can have about that. About that. But mo- most important, I think really the highlight of this conversation for me is to provide some hope and giving us a specific strategy that we can actually have a chance of turning this whole system around if we take action at the local level, it, it's a just absolutely fascinating conversation and you're going to love it. So please watch it, not at one at 1.5 or 2X, watch it at 1X and watch the whole thing. You're going to love it. I have a great relationship at mm-hmm. a great bank and it is one of the great joys of my life wherever i am all over the world because i travel all over the world mm-hmm. you know whenever i have a problem you know i just pick up the phone and call them and it's it's wonderful you know they're they're watching my back and it it makes an enormous difference the system we're facing which is very much driven by the tech is trying to to harvest or steal our wealth. And we're trying to build wealth. You know, right now, for example, I think the number one thing stopping anybody from building wealth is what I call the great poisoning. So it's critical instead of me just going in and doing, uh, you know, sort of whatever the software bots encourage me to do vis-a-vis food or nutrition or my health, it's, it's essential that I say, wait a minute, you know, what are my personal goals and how do I optimize them? AI is a component piece of a system that's been very successful at brainwashing and propaganda and mind control. When you combine it with entrainment and subliminal programming and propaganda and, uh, and sort of software that creates addictions, you know, you, you create this phenomenal infrastructure of things that really suck people in. Part of the power is it is not how it's manipulating our mind. It's access to tremendous data about what we're thinking, what we're doing, Mm -hmm. you know, what we want. And so it's the surveillance component in in combination with the rest of those. And of course, AI just makes it turbocharged. You know, think of this as every, every country and every county is full of wonderful people who've been going along with a criminal syndicate. And it's like a tapeworm. And we need to detox the criminal syndicate and go back to productive living. And that's going to be part local and it's going to be part national or global. It's both. Welcome, everyone. This is Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health. And today we are joined with Catherine Austin Fitz, who is really one of the ideal people to discuss in these times as we are emerging the a global cabal's great reset. And we're going to talk about some really important topics. You don't want to pay close attention. And there's very few people that are well qualified as her to comment on this because not only is she brilliant and really smart, but she's an insider. She was the former assistant secretary of HUD, Housing and Urban Development, I believe, uh, during the Reagan administration, which of course was a public administration. And she got a lot of insights and in how politics works. And and uh, so she uses that and her commitment to truth and freedom and integrity to help us all figure this thing out. We're going to really focus on a lot of good, important things that you need to know about today. And one of them is banking. Um, Catherine has done a, she works really closely with the CHD, Children's Health Defense, and did recently, a, uh, earlier this summer, uh, a four-part series on banking. And I think that may have been catalyzed by Chase's <laughs> uh, debanking of uh, my financial re- accounts with them and my not so much mine because I really didn't have any personal accounts with Chase at all. It was my staff and my business that was affected. So uh, we're going to talk about that and some really other exciting things that I think are even more exciting. So welcome and thank you for joining us today, Catherine. Well, thank you. And thank you for everything you're doing for health, freedom and freedom. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a team effort and you're certainly a big part of that. So I think maybe, maybe we can jump into the um, 
financial component. Well, curious, was was your focus? Yes. So what, so what? we've been doing for several years financial rebellion on CHD TV. And we regularly get questions on banks. How do I find a good local bank or credit union? What are the questions I ask? How do I do diligence? And um, and I do financial rebellion with my general counsel, Carolyn Betts, who is great at all the incredible detail of banking. And when you um, when when you started publishing about the issues with Chase, we just got a tsunami, a new round of questions. And I said, <laughs> Carolyn, <laughs> we're going to sit down and we're going to. And the, and, it, and the title is how to develop a great relationship. Uh, mm-hmm. Or how to how to develop a successful relationship with a, a a great bank because the you know what I want everybody to have is a really successful relationship with a great bank and it makes an enormous amount of difference to your life and once upon a time people thought they could just go online or walk into a bank get any old account and it would be professional mm-hmm. and function. It's not that you know now we're not talking about we're talking about a significant relationship. And it's very important that your banker know you and you know your banker, you you have a relationship where you can pick up a phone and call if there's a problem and get things handled. It's it's an important relationship and train tracks in your life. And you need to invest and make sure it goes right. So we decided, okay, we're going to go through every bit of the detail. And we collected all the questions we've gotten over the last uh, well, I in 2004, I published an article called How to Find a Good Local Bank at Solary.com, at the Solary Report. And we just took all the questions we've gotten s- since the very beginning and rolled them up into a very detailed four-part series that goes through every possible aspect of how you might relate to your bank and and how to how to find a good bank and how to build a relationship with the bank. And what I have to tell you is I have a great relationship at mm-hmm. a great bank, and it is one of the great joys of my life. Wherever I am, all over the world, because I travel all over the world, mm-hmm. you know, whenever I have a problem, Joe, you know, I just pick up the phone and call them, and it's it's wonderful. You know, they're they're watching my back, and yes. um, and it it makes an enormous difference. It takes time to to find the right bank or credit union and to build the right relationships. But uh, anyway, so we go through it in all the gory detail, and I encourage anybody who's not satisfied or happy with their bank or nervous about their bank to go listen to the to the whole thing you know it's something something you can listen to and and we have the questions for each part listed so you can skip around you know if a part of say about uh, how to take take out a mortgage is not relevant to you so i really encourage you to do that you know it's the great thing to do while you're driving or cleaning to go through all the gory details so there it is finally well, <laughs> thank you for compiling that, and uh, oh, thank you for the for for your pain and in inspiring that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really it wasn't so much pain to me personally as it was to my business and and staff. Right, and my CEO and CFO, it was just devastating. But uh, actually, because I had learned the lesson, I, it was my first rodeo for debanking. They debank PNC debanked me two years previously at the beginning of the pandemic, right. which made perfect sense. This Chase debanking made absolutely no sense because there was nothing new that happened, just came out of the blue. I, I still, and they've never provided us with an answer. They don't have to, you know, it's part of their, their, their rules, but the, we're going to post the, the four part series you did on, on the, the page that has this embedded with this video. And uh, the, the, because CHD, uh, did the interview Polly, it was through Polly's uh, portion of it. And she's engaged in this, Vax bus uh, program. So right. the first part of most of those is delayed. <laughs> so it's so we'll put the point where you start off with your with okay. your program, okay. and uh, so it just make it a little easier to, to get to the chase because you know a lot of people don't have time to be sorting through this and they say where is this Catherine's? No, it's right it's right there. But I want right. to emphasize the fact that you mentioned relationship multiple times in your in your yes. response and that you know i've watched all four parts and that was the key take home it's, it's all about a relationship and it wasn't like it was in the past at right. all 
where right. you could just go in and sign up and you're set. And, you know, there was absolutely no uh, review or, or groundwork that was required, but now it's completely different. And you will, you will use the analogy of almost like getting married. <laughs> it's yes. that much it of an is effort. Actually, it, it's, it's a, the financial equivalent of a marriage. Yeah. And it's so important that your basic transactions, you know, run on a platform that you can trust. One of my favorite quotes, and I keep quoting it and promoting it, is from one of the doctors in Switzerland. He said, the currency of the future will be relationships of trust. And so when we think about our financial life, we have to think about, okay, what are the personal and professional and institutional relationships that I have? And how can I make sure that they're trustworthy? Yeah, so you've got to have a, a good one that right. you, you're liked with and you can pick up the phone and talk to a person that you have yes. a relationship with. So let me tell you, you. Two, two of my favorite bank stories. I was in several years ago, I was in Italy to see Beethoven's Ninth in the um, Verano Amphitheater. And we were the uh, in the summer, the cathedrals have these wonderful free concerts. So we were cathedral hopping, going from concert to concert. And we were walking from one cathedral to another and we'd stopped and gotten some Italian gelato. And it was just, you know, we were kind of high on the music and, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a day when you didn't want to think about banking anyway. So my phone rings and it's my bank saying somebody just charged $500 at Paris Disney world. And we are sure it's not you. (laughs) There you go. And I said, it's not me. Shut that card down. Bam. Now, mm-hmm. if the, if I'd been in a big bank with no relationship, that could have, you know, required it would have taken me days to figure it out, days to get it unraveled, days to, you know, get it changed or fixed. Um, you know, perfect example. Another time I flew into Romania and for the first time in many years, my debit card didn't work. I mean, mm-hmm. normally my debit card works everywhere in the world. And so I got on the phone with my bank and they stayed on the phone with me for 30 minutes until we got it to work. Hmm. And, you know, and so I was never I was never sitting in Romania without cash. So, you know, that's but when I call them, they know who I am. I can find somebody who knows me, who I have a relationship with. And anybody can have that if you invest in finding the right institutions and and build a relationship. And that's the kind of thing you want if there's a problem. Yeah, for sure. Because there yeah. invariably, there will be a problem at some point in time. They're almost right. often absolutely. Absolutely. It's just life. That's the way life works. So, right. but in my experience with credit cards, typically that mine aren't associated with the bank. The, because most of the ones I use are Amex. Right. So, but they they're liable if there's a charge on your card and it's not valid, to they're liable to pay that charge. So they're they right. have very sophisticated algorithms that you know monitor things very carefully, probably with a lot of AI and, and embedded in there too. But if anything gets out of the pattern. We get a call. They, they, they. We get a call from the security service, and uh, it's kind of a pain. But it's good that you know. It's good. It's, that, good. it's right, good right. that they do that. It means they're got your back. You right. know that you will. You. Do, it's okay to be annoyed that they're calling you and shutting your card down because it could be a problem. You definitely want them to do that. So one of the most frightening salary reports I ever did was with Bob Sullivan on identity theft. Mm-hmm, sure. And I worked very hard to find the sort of top people on identity theft. Bob was one of them. And after we went through all the different things that could go wrong and how to prevent it, one of the things he said, I'll never forget it, is he said, check your accounts. Mm-hmm. You know, just regularly check your accounts. Because a lot of times what we'll find is the, you know, they'll put through a $2.50 test mm-hmm. to see if they can get away with it. Right. And if we're sweeping and checking our accounts, we catch it and then it doesn't go on to something bigger. Yeah. So so, you know, you you want the companies to to have your back and as you described, do what you say, but you also want to regularly check your accounts because this is a you know, your financial transaction train tracks are very, very important and you can't afford for them to be compromised. No, not at all. And I think most likely identity theft is a serious problem. They they right. almost got away with it on me because I made the most common mistake, which was respond to an email that appeared legitimate. It, they were they were phish, right. it's called a phishing attack, and they replicated an, an eBay. And no, normally I don't use eBay, but that time in my life I was just in the middle of this transaction with eBay, so I just assumed it was related to that, and I wound up sharing my 
information, which is what they want to do. And once they've got it, it's off to the races and they could take your yeah. house, you take everything. Right. And, and then ruin you for a long time if you don't right. catch it early. So you got to be super careful. I didn't catch it. Catch it er- yeah. Catch it early. Catch it early. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I've got a lot of personal curiosity questions uh, with your level of expertise, and, and because we we all agree that the global cabal exists and this great reset appears to be imminent, so so many questions. Where do we start? Uh, I think that probably the first one along along those lines is acknowledging that we're just about we're eleven months in, almost to the day when uh, Chat GPT, a large language model, and the progenitor of almost all the other ones that are out there. Right was released as you know the the form of ai that we're most familiar with uh certainly not agi artificial general intelligence but it's a significantly powerful and absolutely beyond surprising implementation that we thought was years away maybe a decade away but to have right. this of, of of power so and they're giving it to us which is really unusual and for the most part it's free you could there's paid versions of course they're a little better but it's basically free so if this if they're giving this away for free they probably have souped up versions and they have been but by they i mean mr global you know the people in charge have been enormously beyond enormously successful in brainwashing and propagandizing uh, the the public probably if not the majority certainly very close to it and maybe even more than the majority with with the the existing strategies that they have and now that they have ai right it's it, its power is going to probably be exponentially improved to to brainwash people and i'm wondering if you've given that implementation so, of ai so into I th- I th- some thought. Uh, yeah so i think ai is a component piece of a system that's been very successful at brainwashing and propaganda and mind control. You know, it's mm-hmm. a complex formula of how they influence and manipulate people. Mm-hmm. So, so yes, it's been very successful. And when you combine it with entrainment and subliminal programming and propaganda and, uh, and sort of software that creates addictions, you know, you, you create this phenomenal infrastructure of things that really suck people in. Part of the power is it is not how it's manipulating our mind. It's access to tremendous data about what we're thinking, what we're doing, mm-hmm. you know, what we want. And so it's the surveillance component in, co- in combination with the rest of those. And of course, AI just makes it turbocharged. And have you ever seen the movie about East Germany surveillance called The Lives of Others? No, I haven't. I haven't. Oh, it's really it's a really powerful movie that describes what it's like to be under 24 seven surveillance, mm-hmm. which I experienced when I was in Washington litigating with the federal government. And, and what I try and tell people, I get them, I try and get them to watch that movie and say, you know, you are under 24 seven surveillance by AI and software bots from all these different organizations, companies, and governments. And the problem is not that you're just under, it's not like you're under surveillance by one, you know, mm-hmm. every company, Every government, you know, you you have hundreds of these things, and each one of them has no interest in optimizing your personal experience. They're trying to optimize whatever the point of view is of that company or that institution. So they're just trying to get their piece. And so you have hundreds of these things targeted at you, doing surveillance of you, collecting data, and trying to nudge and influence you for their individual point of view and purpose. And so it creates this enormous state of incoherence. And it's the only way I can describe it. And of course, our challenge is how do we manage to organize and optimize for our best interest? So mm-hmm. one of the th- one of the ways I describe it is the the system we're facing, which is very much driven by the tech is trying to to harvest or steal our wealth and we're trying to build wealth um you know right now for example i think the number one thing stopping anybody from building wealth is what i call the great poisoning and the reason i love your website is for years you know you've been trying to defend and protect people from the great what i call the great poisoning Mm -hmm. and um and that's critical so it's critical instead of me just going in and doing, uh, you know, sort of whatever the software bots encourage me to do vis-a-vis food or nutrition or my health. 
it's it's essential that I say, wait a minute, you know, what are my personal goals and how do I optimize them? And, you know, work your way through this literal blizzard or tsunami of of online or or electronic tools that are trying to talk you into whatever's good for for that institution or organization. You know, it's it's a war. It's the only way I can describe it. It's a war. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Now, right. you, you had mentioned one of their goals is to capture our wealth and prevent us from building our own. But I, I, I'm questioning that. And, I, and I'm curious to uh-huh. hear about it because we both, you know, I love your term, Mr. Global, which I think <laughs> accurate, is, is a, is a uh, metaphor for the, the families that control the wealth. If, if you think that Elon right. Musk and Jeff Bezos and Larry Ellison are the wealthiest people in the world, you are seriously, <laughs> seriously deluded. These right. guys have only one generation of wealth. There are families that have had dozens of generations, right. centuries, and they're called Mr. Global. We're not going to name them because there's no need to, but they exist. Just that right. same concept. Right. So th- it seems to me they've accumulated the vast majority of wealth in the world already. So yes. why do they need, you know, a few hundred thousand, a million dollars here? It doesn't make sense. They, they, I mean, there's got to be not, another motivation. There's another right. so, motivation. so money money is simply a management system. Money is a control system. So, um, you know, so they're not so much interested in money as in managing the crowd. Mm-hmm. And, and digital technology, if you look historically – one of the most profitable businesses and the businesses that makes it easy to manage the crowd is slavery. And unfortunately, my personal experience with the folks within Mr. Global Basket, you know, they believe in and practice slavery. Mm-hmm. And and digital technology, if you go back and look at why we canceled slavery the last time around, digital technology can solve those problems. And so I think they are centralizing control because they can because the technology affords them the opportunity and the ability to do it. And so far, they've been successful. I mean, if you look at the tremendous centralization we've dealt with since World War II, um, you know, this has been a steady push. Now, part of that is not just because they can. Part of that is if you look at the risk issues they're managing, they truly believe that they cannot trust the general population in a period of faster and faster learning speeds and change to keep up and make intelligent decisions about the risk management issues they face. We have um, every quarter on the Solaria Report, we do a series called News Trends and Stories. And the first one is on the top 20 stories. But the second one is a a whole Solaria Report just on the unanswered questions. And of course, the big unanswered questions are, what are the risk issues that keep Mr. Global up at night? Mm -hmm. You know, what are they worried about? And and if you look at some of the geophysical risks, I believe one of the reasons they they globalized was they wanted to create the engineering and other capacity they needed to go into space because you don't want to bet the ranch on one planet. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's a real push in space because for a variety of reasons, but one of them is simply diversification. And I think they are worried about one or more geophysical risks is my guess. Mm. Well, they may blow up the planet. There's a realistic possibility. <laughs> right. they, right. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but it's a possibility. Absolutely. Well, the you know the 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 one the scarier one is nuclear accidents. Mm. You know, all you need is a few nuclear accidents, and and you've got a real mess on your hands. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in addition to what we already have. Right. Exactly. So, so in a previous interview with you. You surprised me with your view on um, crypto, cryptocurrencies. Right. Right. And since that interview, I've come to understand that you were spot on, couldn't be more correct. And in that, you know, for those who, who most people know about cryptos now, especially Bitcoin, which is the, the first cryptocurrency, right. it was developed by Satoshi Nakamoto. That is the story goes is was was a brilliant guy figured this thing out then gifted it to the world and then disappeared. Right, that is a fantasy and a myth. I'm mm-hmm. convinced that he never existed. And Satoshi, realistically, is military intelligence. Right, it's the it it is it, this that's, is their tools. It, it was, that's right. That's one of the, that's the logical explanation. I'm sure. 
I'm highly confident that's correct. But I, I couldn't agree more. I, I'm, I'm at a 99.9% degree of confidence on this. Yeah. Right. So that that bodes. So it's so what do you what's your projections for this? Because it seems like they're going to let it go again. I mean, we're in the winter now. It's going into the the point where the Bitcoin having and, and probably it's suspected the crypto will increase again. But that doesn't mean it's a long term play. It is not something you're going to carry on for generations. It has a limited lifespan. A well, lim- it you know, it depends on how they go to total control. There, there are many different scenarios of how they could go to total control. Just talking, if I were in their shoes, I would not, I would continue to pump and dump crypto Mm -hmm. and use crypto. I wouldn't close it down yet. Okay. So you think it might be around for a few more years? Yeah, I think it might be around. Well, at least it it depends on how their rollout of complete control works with fast payments or CBDC or the other things they're doing. But as long as, uh, you know, they have the ability currently to assert complete control and shut it down or so marginalize it, Mm -hmm. you know, cut off the oxygen to it. Yeah. And they, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's easy for them to assert control. And until then they can continue to pull money out of precious metals and real and hard assets by encouraging retail to go into crypto Mm -hmm. number one, but they can also prototype lots of different technologies and methods with crypto, I mean, the brilliance of what they did with crypto is they got all the freedom fighters and hackers in the software mm-hmm. world, or yes. many of them, to figure everything out for them and do it for free, as mm-hmm. long as they just poured some money into pump and dump the thing. So it was a very, very clever strategy. And, you know, the important thing to understand, if we had a free, um, if we had a free world and a, a world dedicated to freedom, we would absolutely use Bitcoin and cryptos. Mm-hmm. We we would want an analog and a digital system, and we would want private currencies, both you know, both something like Bitcoin or community currencies. Mm-hmm. So you know, so if you're looking at this and thinking about an ideal financial system, you know, your immediate reaction is, "I love Bitcoin. Bitcoin's mm-hmm. great. What's what's not to love about Bitcoin?" One hundred percent. Right. So so there's no. You know, my objection is not to Bitcoin. Um, my objection is to is to an all digital system because that is what affords control. Mm-hmm. And my objection is I'm constantly seeing Bitcoin potentially used to help advantage the bad guys. Yeah. And 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 so you see a lot of great, wonderful people being harmed with the pump and dumps. So I, I don't know if you remember this, but every time they pump Bitcoin, I'm constantly saying, please, 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 if you swap, you know, if you swap into the pump, you're creating taxable liabilities. If you're a US citizen, please sell some and escrow your tax money because on the dump, you're going to discover that your tax liability is greater than your entire position's value. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so so please escrow taxes on the way up. Because otherwise you're going to be toast, and sure enough, every time we get a dump, you know, in comes the, you know, I hear the pain of people who didn't do that, and you know, there you are. I mean, well, here it's also valuable for another strategy because uh, one of the recommendations by the experts to, if you're going to enter crypto, is to do something called dollar cost averaging or DCA as you're buying right. in, so that you get the best price overall. It's clearly the most the best way to do it. There, you right. can't beat that. Right. But you want to do the same thing coming out. It's dollar cost right. out energy. So <laughs> right. as, as Bitcoin's going up, you want right. to be selling. You definitely want to be selling for sure. You well, got to take very, profits. It's, you have to take It's profits. very interesting. I have a couple of subscribers who are very knowledgeable financial people. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of the sort of, you know, 2017, when it was really going to roll, they said, you know, this is, this is a, you know, this is a game and it's going to be a speculative. They're going to pump and dump, and I'm just going to play it, you know. And there are rules of how you play a speculative market. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you said, you you dollar cost average out. And they did. They they just you know in a ruthless, ugly way, they just said this is a scam. I'm going to play mm-hmm. it, it like a speculative scam, and I'm going to make a lot of money. And they did. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, if you yeah. know if you know what they're doing, and not many people do. The people who understand what we just discussed is probably under one percent of the population. Easily. Yeah. No would have had, Here's the thing that when, when I did that interview with you on Bitcoin, 
Um, you know, I had done a very, uh, at the time in 2017, I was an investment advisor. And so there are very strict rules and very good rules about how to do due diligence and and what are the standards if you recommending something to your client, whether it's do it or don't do it or, mm-hmm. you know. And so I I started on a serious due diligence and it was funny because I finally decided I am way in over my head. So I have a brilliant, brilliant friend and subscriber who was the former head of research at National Semiconductor and has a PhD from MIT. And I said, you got to help me. So he jumped in and we spent a couple of hundred hours just learning wow. about crypto and Bitcoin. And then I took, I rolled up all my questions and I flew to Baltimore. I called Bill Benny and I said, you know, who was the former NSA uh, technical director. And I said, Bill, I got a bunch of questions for you. And I flew, to, I flew, flew to Baltimore and sat and had a long lunch with Bill Benny and asked him every question. And then I finally felt like, okay, I think I understand this. But the advantage I had was I understood all the classic custodian issues in the securities world. And mm-hmm. and you had a, a wonderful industry of people who were new to custodian issues who had no training or background in custodian issues and you had no regulation and they really didn't know. They really didn't know. And, um, and they also didn't know, you know, having litigated with the department of justice for 11 years and dealt with very extreme physical harassment. I have a lot of knowledge about the legal and covert operations related to how control is affected in a financial situation. Because I was targeted, you know, they tried to set me up on a phony frame of financial fraud. And so I learned a tremendous amount about how you litigate and enforce on financial issues. It was sort of by the outward bound of my MBA program. And and so those two, you know, sort of understanding classic custodian and then, you know, how real control works in the real world, um, you know, those were just two pools of knowledge that a lot of people in the Bitcoin world didn't know yet because they're young and enthusiastic. And, and frankly, they've enjoyed a tremendous amount of liberties that people in the rest of the world don't experience no. or know. Yeah, and that so, custodian issue was the crux of what happened with FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried and right. Uh, uh, right. The, a, a few others that were right. involved. So, I mean, they, they, it was all related to the custodian issue. and and Right. And there was a lot of people were fooled, but they, they didn't do your deep dive and due diligence that you did and had your training and background to understand this was a serious issue. Well, but part of it, it it's funny because I, you know, I like to look at things from Mr. Global's point of view and, and understand things from Mr. Global's point of view. And, um, you know, I was raised to have a lot of empathy with Mr. Global's point of view, so it helps me do it. But um, one of the things that was very clear once the financial crisis hit um, was that the debt growth model was coming to an end and the race was on to get the hard assets. In other words, you want the land, you want the precious metals, you want the water, you want the minerals. It's really funny. When I went to the Sunday after 9-11, I went to this wonderful church in Hickory Valley, Tennessee. It's got a fabulous pastor named Melvin Buford, who I love. And he came up to the podium. Everybody was on pins and needles waiting to see what he'd said. And he got up and he, he stared at the congregation for about 30 seconds. And then he said, ladies and gentlemen, rush hour cometh. <laughs> <laughs> and what he meant was, you know, the war is now on for the real assets. That's mm-hmm. exactly. It was right. I was doing a research work with a, a firm in the city of London. And right afterwards, I called them and I said, you you got to get a load of this. And, and of course, their next newsletter was the title was Rush Hour Cometh. But, you know, from especially after the financial crisis, it started with 9-11 and the move in of the army into the Middle East. But then you have a shift of the smart money slowly out of the bond market and fixed income into establishing control of the real assets. So you have the central bankers around the world buying gold, particularly in the in the BRIC nations, buying and building their stockpile. In 2005, Russia just went on a program to completely move their reserves out of dollars and into gold. Um, but then we saw in 2008, if you looked at the list of the 100 top landowners in the United States. I think by 2012, their their land holdings, Joe, had doubled. Mm. And so there was a real push by the central banks and the big money to move steadily into real estate and precious metals and company, you know, like Buffett's buying the railroad companies, Buffett's buying the big gas 
producers or or energy distribution companies. And so so you see this shift into hard assets. So it's a no brainer that you would want to want to interest retail in digital assets to keep them out of the market. Mm-hmm. In other words, mm-hmm. you want them to walk away from gold and buy Bitcoin because the last thing you want is the competition to buy up all right. that stuff. Yeah. And it sure. was it was so obvious. I I always tell the story of when I was I went to Basel. I was in Basel and I drove by the BIS to go to the train station. This is when I was in the middle of the due diligence. So I go in 2017 and of course Bitcoin was not anywhere near as popular, you know, at the beginning of 2017 as it was even the next year. And so so I go into the Swiss railway you know, they have these machines where you buy your ticket on the Swiss mm-hmm. railway. It's just taking the train over to Zurich. And it offered me the opportunity to buy my Swiss railway ticket, you know, right next door to the BIS in Bitcoin and top off my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, this is oh, not thanks. a grassroots, this is not a grassroots. Well, I, you know, I, I mean, I had no objection to buy. If I'd had Bitcoin, I would have bought it. it be, you know, I have no objection to that. But what was funny is I realized whatever this is, is not a grassroots phenomenon. You had no. all the, you had Zug, um, you know, which is one of the great sort of tax havens and tax deal places outside of Zurich. You had the Zug guys promoting the fact that they were the new center of cryptocurrency globally. And that was 2017, you know, it was in the ads in the stations. So, so whatever it was, it wasn't a grassroots phenomenon. So I think we've well established that uh, the existing crypto market is is a scam. It's a fraud at the fundamental level, and it's controlled by Mr. Global. Uh, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it a scam. I would call it a prototype. Okay, a prototype, but it's it's, it's not what you, it's not what it appears to be. And it, most, it is it is most not... largely related to the fact that it's centralized. That's where they get the control. Because you mentioned digital being an issue. But I don't th- think that digital is an issue as much as the centralization as opposed to decentralization. Right. Right. That... But digital technology, you know, digital technology could be wonderful in helping us decentralize and build extraordinary new wealth, but mm-hmm. it's not being used that way. Mm-hmm. If you use it how technology is being used to centralize control which is the opposite of how you would want to use it if you if you wanted to build the maximum amount of wealth. And I think what happens, Tim Wu had a wonderful book about this. I don't know if you've ever gotten Tim Wu on the show, but mm-hmm. um, he was a Columbia professor. I think he's a law professor who ran for lieutenant governor. But he wrote a book about how for the last couple hundred years, a new information technology will come out and all the entrepreneurs say, Oh, this is wonderful. We can use this to build freedom and, you know, new decentralized wealth. And so you have this wonderful period of prototyping and and creativity. And then suddenly, wham, everything comes down to a few things and it it institutes more central control. And so you have this process where we all get tricked and then boom, you know, it comes in. and, And I think the same thing has happened to us with digital technology, including crypto. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to go to a different topic now, which is uh, I think we're both equally enamored with Whitney Webb as being one of the best investigative journalists out there. And yeah, I I just have to announce our new uh, our new third quarter wrap up is uh, a piece by Whitney on um, on AI. Okay, great. I'd love to look at that because she's she's just amazing. She's just so brilliant and insightful. And and I, I know we we both cherish her equally. So anyway, right. her most recent podcast uh, was exceptional. It was maybe one of the best she's done with respect to the coming global reset. And she announced that from her analysis, she's projecting within the next year, likely sometime in 2024, maybe even sooner, um, there is going to be a cyber attack on the banks. They are going to use, it's of course, it's a, false flag. It's a 9-11. Right. 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 So they're going to use this as a justification to implement the Cyber Patriot Act. And internet's going to be down. Who knows for how long? Days, weeks, months, who knows? But then they're right. going to release it back and there's going to be, the only way you're getting it back on is you're going to have to be authorized through your ISP through this form of digital ID, which is essentially going to be equivalent to the CBDCs. Right. So I'm wondering if you a have heard of that and what and what your views are. Do you agree with it or what's your position? 
No, I haven't had a chance to listen to it, and that's what I'll do. I'll make sure I listen to it this week. And if Whitney thinks um, that it's a plausible scenario, I would take it very seriously. Yeah. So this is one of the scenarios they've been working on, um, and it certainly tracks. It's a more sophisticated version of what they did during the Depression to you know, sort of wholesale bring the banks down. Um, so this is one of the scenarios that's possible, and there is no doubt right now there is an effort to control and and engineer sort of uh, consolidation in the banking system. Now, the question in my mind, which I don't know the answer to, is will they be ready by 2024? And if you look at the Fed bringing up the FedNow system, mm -hmm. it's still voluntary to join it. And I just don't know operationally if they can you know, if they can make this work in 2024. Now, if you look at what's happening globally, they may be forced to, you know, to, you know, to just do it and, and have it be very organic and messy. But is this a plausible scenario? Yes, it's a plausible scenario. This is, I think eventually, I mean, we, we have a very limited time with the internet as we know it now. And the internet as we know now is, is almost exponentially inferior to what we had previously when there Correct. was censorship. I mean, I've, I've been censored for well over a decade. The censorship started getting severe about seven years ago, though, and then it, right. it exploded from there and with COVID. So we know what our access to natural health information and to understand the corruption and the fraud with the all these industries that are poisoning us uh, is, is, is essentially being censored. It's being you cannot access it. And the tools, the resources you're going to need to survive, not only survive, but to thrive in the coming times is essentially being called out of. Right. It's it's funny. I'm looking at your beautiful bookshelf and for. Mm -hmm. I don't know, 15 years, I've been making sure I buy everything I need in hard copy on the assumption that everything digital would be censored. Yeah, and that, it is. that yeah. we would need a library of gardening and, you know, all sorts of technologies and skills we would need in a hard copy. And one of the things I would say to our listeners is, you know, if you don't have it in hard copy, for heaven's sakes, print it out or buy it now because you're you want to have a complete archive of everything you need you know, in, in analog form. Absolutely. That is a key part of the equation, the essentials, right. because, right. you know, most, most of us, I mean, it's a lot, humanity has devolved in so many ways. And with respect to our reliance on technology and our, and our, our ability to comprehend it and do some basic functions yes. that our, our recent ancestors, even perhaps even our parents, certainly our grandparents was almost all of them were able to do. And we can't, we don't know how to do it anymore. Right. We've lost that knowledge, just skill right. set. If you if you read the stories of who did well in the depression, you know, what you hear are stories of people in communities that had among each other all the skills they needed for survival. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why anything you can do to build your skills, particularly in the food and health area, it's I often talk with people about how to start community currencies or network currencies. And what I say to them, look. If you haven't worked out the health and food, you know, whatever you do in the currency area won't work. Yeah, that and, is the currency. <laughs> right. But you need and, to survive health and well, food. Well, there's a reason Mr. Global is trying to, I don't know, did you get our copy of Pharma Food? I know we sent you one. I don't know if you have it yet. Um, no, our I latest wrap-up is is on synthetic food and lab uh, lab grown meat. Yeah, I heard, truly, I heard your interview with Greg Hunter on it. It was it was it was fascinating. It's, you and know it, something? It's the most the, terrifying yeah, thing. Netherlands researcher who's just profoundly excellent. Yeah, uh, Elsa von Hamel. Elsa, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So she did. She did pharma food, and then we had her do Dutch farmers and fishermen. And both of them, it shows how the Dutch farmer and fishermen are connected to the whole global agenda, One Health, the WHO, everything. It's really wonderful. So these two pieces really sort of out what they're doing in the food area. And one of the reasons they're trying to get complete central control of food is. You can't get central control of the financial system and currency unless you have that kind of control of food. It's, mm -hmm. you know, they're two sides of the same coin. So you absolutely want to make sure in the health and food area that you are, you know, you you are ready to be as resilient as you possibly can be. And one of the, you know, when we did pharma food, I thought it would be sort of the least popular thing we'd ever done, but I felt we had to do it anyway because it was very important for people to know 
And what I discovered is all the fresh, we have a lot of fresh food people in our, our, you know, viewership as do you. And what they're all doing is they're using it to finally persuade their spouse or family member that they have to go all in for local fresh food and gardens and, you know, do everything they can to build a resilient food supply. Mm-hmm. And um, and so absolutely that's critical. And have you ever thought of putting together packages of all your information in different areas? So they oh, funny you should say this. And no, this wasn't a <laughs> softball that I asked Catherine before the interview to throw a question at me. But no, yes, I have actually. Right. And I'm in the process of creating a course of the most important information I've learned in the last 50 years about health and resilience. Wow. So each course is about an hour, an hour and a half, and has ex- there's lots of resources. I mean, each module, and it's a 10-module right. course, and I'm about halfway through. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be available probably in another month or two. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Sure. I'll, get you, I'll get you a down- copy for sure. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. you'll be able to download and, and store the information, and uh, the transcripts and all the details, because you got to have this di- information. But yes. I couldn't agree more with the food. But fortunately, the solution is pretty simple. They, they're, they're making it worse as you went into in your new report. But it, it all boils down to staying away from processed foods. That's it. Yes. Because they, they, they bastardized the system at the time of the Civil War when they created the ability to extract oils from seeds. And it's you know, so seed oils, essentially, and it's just pervasive in all the processed foods. And if, But if you eliminate processed foods, and of course, all seed oils, it, the, the, the quality of your diet is going to go up exponentially. I mean, that's right. the single most important thing you do. And, ex, and processed foods includes most restaurants. People don't realize that. They right. think, oh, I'm going right. to a restaurant is fine. It's no problem. They got health. No. I mean, if it's a health food restaurant, likely they're using these, these seed oils, which is the worst. I'm convinced. Well, it's maybe this new technology with the mRNA vaccines and everything, what they're doing and creating these synthetic proteins and meat, fake fake food, fake meat. But it's seed oils is fundamentally the the in my view, and this is actually one of the first modules in my course. The primary reason for the explosion, the epidemic we have in all chronic disease, obesity, right. heart right. disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, every one of those is related to seed oils. So, so let me tell you the positive thing that I'm seeing. Oh, good. I for, like positives. So, so since 1991. You know, I came out of the Bush administration. I said, they're going to take digital technology and kill us all. We need another plan. So basically, you know, I spent the 90s prototyping, you know, how we could do a positive reset instead of the current reset, Um, but a a wealth building reset that Mm. that would protect and preserve the middle class, which is very possible, even at this late stage. Anyway, so so I spent my time doing that. And I was absolutely convinced that, um, you know, part of getting that kind of reset going was you need a critical mass of people who understood that this push to centralize control was going to go to a place where we couldn't afford to go. I mean, first of all, it was going to destroy us. It was going to kill us. You know, there was somebody who was trying to kill us. They were trying to steal our stuff Mm -hmm. and kill us. And it started, you know, it started, I wrote an online book called Dylan Reed and the Aristocracy about how they were targeting poor neighborhoods with the predatory lending and the pill mills and the private prison sweeps, et cetera. But I think a lot of people thought, oh, that's just poor people. I'm safe. What I'm now seeing that I have not seen until now is a critical mass of people saying, you know something? My doctors are lying to me. I cannot trust them. Mm -hmm. My government is lying to me. I cannot trust them. And in fact, there is a plan to kill me. Mm -hmm. And it relates to the food. It relates to the spray. It relates to the pesticides. It relates to the injections. It relates to the pharmaceuticals. And the whole thing is not trustworthy. Now, this is the first time since 1991, I spent 10 years as an investment advisor. This is the first time that I've seen a critical mass of very capable, well-educated professional people with real skills or, you know, people who do the concrete work of the world, whether it's truckers, plumbers, you know, they were much quicker to get this. But now you you have a whole world of people of doctors and scientists and and people coming together and saying, you know, this was a mass atrocity. They're trying to kill us, you know, and that's a simple breakthrough because once you have a clear picture of the problem, 
then you start to use your time effectively. Once you realize it's really that bad, mm-hmm. and this is the first time since 1991 that I'm starting to see significant critical masses of capable, competent, hardworking people come to the realization, oh, you know, there's a coup, somebody's trying to kill me, and my job is to protect my family and stay alive. And that's a breakthrough. I mean, we're, we're, okay. we so, are now in the middle of a huge breakthrough. So most likely in 91, the number of people, the percentage of the population that understood that was way under 1%. Now, 2023, late 2023, where do you think that percentage lies? I think in America, that percentage lies at about 25 to 30%. Wow, that is right. so encouraging. And, and I think that group of people, many of them are reticent to talk about it. Mm-hmm. But I think that group of people um, uh, is a highly, th- those are people who can shift things. Mm-hmm. And I think they, one of the things they have in combination is they tend not to be susceptible to mind control technology. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's their nature, their background. You know, I just watched a video that said um, 25 to 30% of the population is not susceptible to the entrainment. Mm -hmm. technology. I don't know if that's right or true. You know, I have no way of corroborating that, but you know, that's my experience. So I think these are people who are less susceptible or they don't ingest a lot of media. You know, they don't Mm -hmm. because I stopped watching TV in 1984 when I heard the billionaire types talking about the mind control technology they were going to roll out (laughs) on TV. So I was like, oh, that's it for me and TVs. But um, so I think, I think, but the big breakthrough uh, is COVID when they saw people they love essentially killed by either the injection or the remdesivir protocols or the, you know, it takes a lot to get a person to realize that their local hospital is euthanizing relatives or their, you know, the injection is poison and is is intentionally killing people. That's a big shift for them to, you know, to, to digest if they've grown up in a world where they had, you know, they felt they could depend on their doctor. So so this is a big emotional and mental shift for a lot of people. And it's an emotional and mental shift that some people can't make. But I think there's about 25 to 30 percent, whether they've seen relatives die uh, and, and get killed or poisoned. You know, they're watching people being poisoned and, and they're seeing it and they, they can now recognize it in a way, you know, that was hard to recognize three years ago. So do you think the COVID or the COVID <laughs> scam, <laughs> scam is is may backfire on them eventually? Or do you think that it, it, it basically achieved with they're very pleased and satisfied with it and uh, full full speed ahead to, to the next level, which is probably loss of the Internet and the next pandemic? So the, so the question is, they've they've poisoned a significant number of people. We just don't know how many. Mm-hmm. And um, and they've debilitated a lot of the small business, small farm sort of labor capacity. Um, Is that enough? I don't know. I think the big question I have is how much of their goal was sterilization Mm. and between the injections and shedding, have they, have they accomplished it? I don't know. I just don't know. I think, you know, I was out at the Western price conference and Sally fell on Morell at the end of the conference did the closing session. And she said, okay, the most important thing is all you young women, I want you to go make healthy, healthy, happy babies. And everybody else, your number one priority should be to support and help them do that. They yeah. are the future. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, I, I just don't know. And and the big question is how much how much damage can shedding do? Yeah. I mean, there's it, fortunately it, it can do a lot of damage, there's no question, but there are simple things that you can do that can mitigate that. Fortunately, right. it's not that big of a challenge. I discussed some of them in the modules I'm creating. So I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about you know their movement towards global slavery. And I, I haven't reached a, a position on this yet because I mean, you're just guessing, you're trying to make the best guess with the knowledge that we have. But I mean, there's a 
good possibility they're going to get away with it. But there's a strong possibility, too, that this 25 to 30 percent could be the remnant that prevents them from doing it, or at least goes off in the corner somewhere and let them self-destruct. So, so here's the critical issue. If you go to Solari, we have a collection of financial transaction freedom and CBDC video shorts mm-hmm. and links to articles that talk about what you can do in the United States. So I'm just going to talk about the United States right now. The powers not delegated to the federal government by the states are reserved to the states. Mm -hmm. And state legislators have the power to create independent payment and custodian systems that can protect citizens and and stop the Fed and the Treasury from doing this. Mm -hmm. And there is a legal basis, given that there's $21 missing from the U.S. government Treasury, there is legal basis to create common law right of offsets that give the state legislators the power to absolutely, you know, if the if the Treasury and Fed try to steal our pension fund securities or steal citizen securities or, you know, play games with custodian or the banks, the states have the power to offset as long as they they have the financial train tracks set up within the state, even if we have to do it by Pony Express and bicycle. Mm-hmm. So so the state, the states absolutely have the legal power if that 25 or 30% will support them and come the time when they cut off your bank account, you know, if the states have, and the state banks have alternatives, you know, there is a place to go. Well, I, I, you, you said, use the term banks as plural. To my knowledge, there's only one state bank in North Dakota. Are there, are there more? Right. There's one state bank. Um, Tennessee's working on a bullion depository, but okay. you don't necessarily have to have a state bank. Um, it's very helpful to have a state bank. We have a piece at Solari called um, uh, that Richard Werner bro- uh, wrote on the power and importance of a state bank. But you know, you would be amazed at the speed at which a state legislator can bring up either a state bank or state independent state payment mechanisms, and um, and they would be well served to do that because unless they do it, they cannot create the conditions of sovereignty for their mm-hmm. citizens. But they have the power to create those conditions of sovereignty, you know, whether it's a, uh, you know, my advice would be do a sovereign state bank if you can constitutionally, if not put together independent payment systems that connect the state with the state banks and the citizens um, and and do a bullion depository. You're going to need a bullion depository, which Texas has done. Excellent. So should there be a move in, in states to go towards this or not uh, in the state Ab- by the community, by the public to push their state legislators that Ab- haven't been corrupted by the system to, to uh, legislate this into action, into law. Absolutely. So if you go again to Solari where it says the financial transaction and CBDC video shorts, if you click on that, you will get a link to a memorandum called financial transaction freedom. And it was prepared at the request of state legislators who and government officials who said, we need you to write a memo on what is financial transaction freedom, what threatens it, and what do we need to do to secure it? And it includes lists of what you can do if you're an individual, what you can do if you're a family, what you can do if you're a business, what you can do if you're an investor, and what you can do if you're a state legislator. And it lays out the whole agenda. And if you can get 25 to 30% supporting their state legislators to do that, we have a way, uh, you know, if if Whitney's white, right, and they do that kind of lockdown, we have a way to jump the curve and say, no, we're, we're not going into that system. We have an alternative. Boy, it, it, that is very exciting and maybe one of the highest priority items that we can encourage people to do, because in my view, typically petitioning your congressman or senator on some bill is kind of like a worthless waste of effort it's not a complete always. waste yeah not it's always a, but you know because right. Marco fisher and nvic has been really very helpful in preventing a lot of negative legislation it's right. she got none, right. none of passed because of right. her, her nvic portal but with respect to not that national politics why not focus it locally where you live in your own state and if you get enough people, you can get these state banks or the equivalent that could right. actually be an alternative to impending doom that they, they, they're they planning on implementing. Right. And if you do that bottom up by state, it gives the great congressmen, because there are a lot of good congressmen who would mm-hmm. like to help, 
but it starts to give them legs they can stand on. So it the you know again go go look at financial transaction freedom. It's in a PDF you can download, you can print it out, you can send it around. It's totally, you know, it's totally free. Feel free to republish, send mm-hmm. everywhere. You can we we sell copies and hard copy, but you don't need that. You can take it to the printer and make your own hard copies where you are. So I would really encourage everyone to send that to their state legislators and circulate that because there is a way. We also have a wonderful piece on taxation. So let me give you, you know, I've written a lot about the $21 trillion and the money missing from the federal government and all the changes in the laws that have given them an excuse to say it's legal for them to steal all the money. So, um, and I also wrote a paper for the presidential campaign candidates on what the issues facing them financially will be and what they need to deal with. So so that's also up there. Um, it's called Solari Paper Number One, and it's a great sort of overview of what the candidates are facing. But if 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 everyone will go to work on doing this, you then build the capacity you need um, at the at the state, and and the states are talking about doing regional compacts. Mm-hmm. So you 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 create at the state and the regional compacts the power. Now let me tell you where this is going to come down to. It's going to come down to taxation with or without representation, because if I control your bank account, I can just raise taxes and take it, right? So so and so we're we're really getting into fundamental property issues. Um, there's 21 trillion missing from the federal government. I um, when the when the litigation ended in 2006, that number, which is now 65,000 per person in America, was up to 14,000. And I owed on a when I got the when I settled the litigation, I got a big settlement in and I was paying off all my creditors, and I owed one of the New York Fed member banks fourteen thousand dollars. Now, what I'm gonna say now, I don't recommend you do unless you have a good lawyer. <laughs> I have a great lawyer. And you're prepared to litigate. I had a great lawyer and I was prepared to litigate. So don't do this unless you have a great attorney and you're prepared to litigate. So so I owed this New York Fed member bank $14,000 and I wrote them a letter and said, you know, that you are the owner of the of the New York Fed. You're the the largest owner and and you do you know, you operate as agent for the New York Fed as depository for the U.S. government. There's 14,000 per person missing. Now I owe you fourteen thousand on this credit card, but you owe me fourteen thousand as a citizen for the money that's disappeared from the federal accounts, and I'm asserting a common law right of offset. So you owe me fourteen, I owe you fourteen, and I'm just we're just calling it a day. Mm-hmm. And um, and I said if you have a problem with that, here's the name and number of my attorney, and I'm happy to negotiate or litigate. So they just wrote off the debt and walked away. It was not a conversation. It appeared they wanted to have. <laughs> so, so that that's called a common law right of offset. And if the states, the states have the power to create escrows and say the U.S. government is in violation of the financial management laws, we invite citizens to put their money in the escrow, and we, the state treasurer and attorney general, will make sure the money is only spent for legally authorized expenditures, that it can't be spent illegally, for example, for things that poison us. Mm-hmm. So so they have the ability. So we have a big piece on taxation and how the states might exercise um, financial management enforcement of the feds. Now, we're starting to see this because we just saw Texas um, call a default on the federal government for not protecting from invasion. They called they 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 called a default and said, OK, we now assert jurisdiction and we're going to take responsibility to protect the Texas border from invasion since you've defaulted on your obligations. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's the same for financial management. There's good news. And I'm reminded that the taxation without representation is, I believe, what catalyzed the Boston Tea Party and the yep. revolution movement. Yep. Well, we're back to the you know, we're at, we're back to the basics. Um, because that, you know, unfortunately, if if Whitney's scenario comes true, they're looking by controlling the financial train tracks. The next thing that happens is whether it's the real estate or the precious metals or the securities, you know, the bank deposits, they're looking basically to siphon off and control or steal all those every asset. 
well, it's 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 a grim potential future, but it is really encouraging to hear that we have a potential to make a significant impact. And it's a serious likelihood that yeah. we can be successful. I mean, this is like I, I, news I've heard in a long time. If enough people come together. So when I was a little girl, I used to get these uh, boils, you know, and and the and the key with the boil was to use your heating pad and get the infection to rise to the surface. Mm-hmm. And what we're dealing with is is like that. It's an infection and it has to rise to the surface. And I've been watching it grow my entire life and feeling it was an emergency. You know, I thought it was an emergency in 1991. And so, so you know, let's let it rise to the surface and let's deal with it. I used to have an ally that's the the bigger the you know the bigger the breakdown, the bigger the breakthrough. It, it, it has to. It's coming to a head, and it's mm-hmm. a very old war. And I will say this, you know, getting back to Mr. Global, um, we do need a reset. And if you come to Solari, a lot of what we write about is, um, you know, so it's an old, I love Tina Turner. And one of my favorite songs of Tina Turner, she starts off and she says, we can do this nice or rough. Mm-hmm. So the going direct reset that they're doing is the rough version. But there is a nicer version. It would have been a lot nicer if we'd started in the 90s. But there is a nicer version, version that builds tremendous wealth. and um, But we do need a reset because we can't, the way we've been living and operating is not sustainable. And, yeah, and there does need to be a reset. So we need to take responsibility to say, okay, Mr. Global, we don't like your reset. We're going to do our reset. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that gets back. And of course, at the very heart of that is managing your health and managing your living equity in a way which is uh, is not only sensible and and ensures that you and your family are healthy, but if you do it, it's highly economic. <laughs> so you know, back to when when did you start your website? Nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, so I remember. I was there. I was there from the very beginning. So you know, that's what you've been doing. You've been trying to lead us into the right kind of reset. And your website is at the heart of of achieving the kind of 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 reset that can really work and build wealth. Uh, thank you for those kind words. I th- I believe that's the case too, and uh, yeah, it's it, it's key to do this. And you had mentioned that this great reset is inevitable, and I suspect that's because it's just pure mathematics. I mean, you cannot continue with this level of debt. So it has to end at some point because it, it, it just, it's a mathematic impossibility. Well, but here, here's, the, here's the thing. You need to understand, go back and look at the history of greenbacks in the United States. Yeah, and the so, Civil War. With Lincoln. Right. So the official, you know, the official numbers indicate that we have 33 trillion plus of outstanding debt. We don't need any outstanding debt. The Treasury could have just issued greenbacks. Mm-hmm. So- the sovereign debt trap is a, you know, it's the ultimate scam. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they say we have $33 trillion of debt. I say we could have issued $33 tr- trillion of greenbacks. And now, uh, you know, that $33 trillion of debt, the proceeds went into the treasury and $21 trillion plus is missing. So, you know, what I say is the whole thing's a scam. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so I don't, uh, you know, I don't buy their numbers, but if I do buy their numbers, you know, my attitude is the states ought to assert a $21 trillion common law right of offset against the Treasury. Now, I bring that up, Joe, because not to be terrifying, I someone had told me that Secretary Yellen had stated that we could afford to engage in war in both the Ukraine and Israel, and America's economy was strong, and there was no economic problem engaging in these wars. So, I wanted to hear what she had to say in detail. So I found the video and watched it. And after about five or 10 minutes, she goes into the fact that the Treasury has a $7 trillion payable from the American people in unpaid and accrued taxes. And I thought, well, wait a minute, you have $21 trillion missing. You ought to go get the $21 trillion. But she's saying, no, I'm going to go collect $7 trillion more in taxes. And I thought, ugh. No wonder they want to destroy the First and Second Amendment. Can you imagine? And she points out how much funding they've uh, they've supplied to the IRS to go collect this seven trillion. So they're planning a huge enforcement wave, and her attitude is, 
we can afford two wars because we're going to go get this seven trillion dollars. So so be warned. I thought they had, had planned or announced that they were hiring 80,000 IRS agents and they were going to arm them. But then uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but I believe that was overturned and they weren't hiring. Um, you know, my guess is I my recollection is that the amounts that they had provided, you know, were said to translate into that many, but they hadn't committed to hire them. My guess is that what you're going to be doing is a very sophisticated AI and software um, and digital contractors who basically plow through all the digital data and play gotcha. Hmm. So I think you're probably, I think the juggernaut here, you know, yes, you are going to have armed IRS agents sort of implementing on the ground, but I think the big juggernaut here is going to be the, is going to be AI. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's a lot more cost effective, that's for sure. <laughs> and more right. More efficient. Right. Oh, right. Boy, well. oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so I think the uh you know, I go back to the financial transaction memo. We also have a great one called I Want to Stop CBDCs. What can I do? What I would really recommend to everybody, the most powerful thing you have right now is your time. Mm -hmm. and and your relationships of trust what you need to do is say okay who can i trust um and and who's around me you know whether it's health or food or finances or any of the day-to-day provision of what i need who who do i have around me how can i build personal resilience and then go take a look at these resources both from you in this course or from um, you know, from Solari, uh, the financial transaction memo, or I want to stop CBDCs, look at the things that you think you can do and then just do them and just keep doing them. We call it at Solari, we call it turtling. We have a new hat called Turtle Forth. It says Turtle Forth on it. And, um, and just, you know, and if everybody does that, particularly supporting their state legislators, if you have good state letters, legislators who are fighting for your health and financial transaction freedom, boy, you want to get on board and support them. Mm. Yeah, it makes so sense. There's there's a tremendous number of things you can do, but you want to get into action and 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 just do them. Get off the couch and just start doing what you can do. Very good news, Catherine. I was wasn't expecting this, but it's uh the the most solid positive suggestion that people that I've heard that people can take to really make a significant dent in their in the cabal right. to implement this. Well, it's I'll tell you one last story. When I was over in we were the Weston Price conference is over in Kansas City and it was a great conference. And we had one subscriber who said, you know, I just I'm from Kansas City. I just don't know any like minded people. I feel so alone. Please can you have a meetup? <laughs> so we just gathered everybody into a room for one of the lunches and um, and she met 15 other people from Kansas City who she just loved. I mean, that's what happens when you meet like minded people in your area. It doesn't take but an hour and you you feel like you're fast friends. And as she was leaving, she showed me the list of all the names and emails. She said, I have 15 new friends. And she said, I'm surrounded by a tremendous number of like minded people. There's a ton of us. Why was I feeling so lonely? And I see that happening every day. So don't. If, if you don't know the people in their area, whether it's, you know, the CHD chapter or the Weston Price chapter or the Solari group or, you know, there's a ton of these groups out there and um, and you just need to go find them and plug in because I'm telling you, there's scores and scores of really hardworking, responsible, wonderful people who are they're there and they want to connect up. So go find them, find your tribe. Yeah. And now is the time to do that. Yeah, because you know yep. if what, what Whitney's projecting is true, your ability to do this is going to be really impaired because you're essentially right. your internet communication is going to be gone. Which is one of the reasons that we have this push to our subscribers to connect with us on mobile, because right. I I'm convinced that Whitney's on target and they're going to take the internet away, not right. forever but for a while. So that's and right. then we, we can't communicate unless you have a phone. So right. You know, we're actually or a mesh, a mesh network. Yeah. Have you looked? That, yeah, sure. That, that, but, but you know, that's a local scenario, right? Right. right. Yeah. So you're not going to be able to communicate with someone on the other side of the country or let alone the other side of the world if you need to, which you can with the cell phone network. Right. So they're going to take the internet down. That, that doesn't, that is 
Now, many phone communications go over the internet, but you don't, right. there's independent cellular network that exists. So right. they're not right. taking that down. That's not part of the system. Right. So, right. You know, but that's a, but that's a good point about finding people locally. Cause that's, you know, you need community is what you need. Right. That's and, important. and you need to be networked globally. So, yeah. so the local, so, you know, it gets back to where I started. The currency of the future will be relationships of trust. Mm-hmm. Who do you trust? Who can you trust? Who can you network with and how between your networks, whether it's health, whether it's food, whether it's finances, how can you build the basic provision of day-to-day life and transactions so that you will be resilient come what may. And don't worry, let's say Whitney's scenario doesn't come true at the timing she says, Mm -hmm. that's where they want to go. So Mm -hmm. get prepared for it as if it's true and Mm -hmm. and you're just going to be ahead of the game if it's Mm -hmm. delayed or, you know, or if we stop them, you know, before they can do it. So, um, you know, just, I think preparing for that scenario is very good practical advice. Yeah, and we could be grateful if you're watching this in the United States that we are not engaged in a war like they are in Palestine and Israel, and that we don't have bombs dropping on us. So we have time and the luxury of that. But but nevertheless, I think right. we use that as an example to understand, to realize, to recognize that this is a war. As you said at the beginning, we are in a war. You may not see, you don't see bombs dropping out your window, but it doesn't matter. They're digital bombs. They're exploding, and you don't know it. Many many of you don't know. It. So you have to. If you well, take- the EMF radiation is a bomb <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've written a book about that i get that case for sure yeah so you know you there's ways to mitigate that but but the but the point is that this is an emergency and even right. though you know we don't we don't have physical destruction it, it, the 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 variables that contribute that are are exist and we need to act now okay well, so one one last question i want to ask you because this is what i i hear that people need Mm-hmm. So if you look, just as an uh, as a former investment advisor, if you look at the management of people's time and resources, the single greatest strain on their finances is what I call the great poisoning. Mm-hmm. If you look at what it does to you, their time, what it does to their money, you know, pharmaceutical fraud, on and on and on. It's it's a huge drain on time and money, and you identified this early on and you've built a website since, okay, since 1997, you've been trying to warn people and help them overcome the great poisoning. Mm -hmm. And you have faced tremendous suppression and censorship and, you know, uh, sort of info and legal warfare, but you've never quit. Mm -hmm. Okay. At all. You just keep coming on stronger every time. So that's what people need to hear. They need to hear, you know, John, my favorite quote from John Rappaport is hopelessness is an op and it's planet wide. You never, uh, y- you just are sure that that you can make a difference. Mm-hmm. Now, I believe that's the perfect attitude because if you look at where these guys are going, you know, going along, we have zero chance. Fighting, we I don't know if it's one percent or you know fifty percent, but yeah. it's it's better than zero, right? Yeah, so yeah. balls to the wall. Let's just fight, you know, now as hard as we can. But how do you how do you encourage other people to have that sense of uh, confidence? You, know, you have this sense of confidence that you can mm-hmm. make a difference and you just never quit. Well, part of it is the the attributes of wanting to be a physician you know that almost everyone who goes to medical school their does you know stated desire and many times it's part it's the tr- the true one and then it gets perverted over time is their their desire to help people improve their health right. i mean right. that's why they want to be a doctor i mean that, not everyone but that's a, most of them so it's it's part of that is just wanting to help people and right. i and i'm just passionate about being healthy myself personally so it's easy to share this and i just get enormous joy and satisfaction about doing that so it's easy it's like rolling off a log and it it doesn't bother me that they're discrediting it, it actually in retrospect it, it is the biggest award the biggest honor i've ever been given in my life to be <laughs> named the number one spreader of disinformation about covid i mean it is there, I, I have I, i'm thinking seriously about getting a i forgot coffee. you were number one <laughs> number one ahead of bobby kennedy 
you know, and, and they use that all the time, anytime. And that, that, and the fact that I'm the main anti-vaxxer, I was got the front page of the Washington Post a few years ago around Christmas is, oh, we finally reveal, we know who's funding the anti-vax movement now. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> well, I would like to point out, uh, I heard, I forget who said this. I heard it in Kansas City. Somebody said, I think it was Sasha Ladipova said, uh, you know, with 1.34% uptake, that means that 98% of Americans are now anti-vaxxers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, she's yeah. good. I think I've interviewed her in the past. Yeah, um, yeah that, I mean, we're making progress. That, that, that is their downside of implementing their strategy is that, you know, there's a, there's a side effect for that when it's going to wake a bunch of people up that already has. Now, right. some of them are not going to because it's so effectively been brainwashed. But, you know, it's it's a war. But I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you're doing. Oh, I'm wondering one, one other question. Do you have any resources on your site about building community? I imagine you might. So I did a tremendous amount um, in the 90s about how to uh, circulate venture capital and equity locally. Mm -hmm. And then I backed off because you couldn't build a critical mass of people, you know, of small business and other people who realized the need to do that. And we're just now seeing that demand kick up again. So we're doing, you know, we're going to start doing more and more local investment. We just did a great uh, interview with Michael Schumann on local investment. He was somebody I worked with briefly in the 90s on local investment, and he just kept going on local investment. Um, and two people I would recommend to you to have on your show is Michael Schumann on local investment. And then Chuck Marone has a great group called Strong Towns that we regularly try and get on about how to build strong towns locally. And the great thing about what Michael and Chuck are doing is first it takes a conversation mm -hmm. and, and building those networks. And a lot of those networks work around food. So we've done a food series on the Solaria Report for many years, and we focused on sort of the nuts and bolts of what you need to do in terms of legislation and law and, and litigation to protect the local fresh food system. And what we encourage people to do is if you want to start building local business and enterprise, you want to start with the food people, because that is one thing that we can be more competitive. You know, locally, we can be more competitive than anyone in the world economically with the local food. And making that go is the beginning of kickstarting all sorts of local venture and equity possibilities. So well, um, I, I anyway. was thinking more more along the lines of co connecting and actually establishing a community because, you know, there's a number of people who live in large urban areas for a wide variety of reasons. And my belief is that when this thing starts becoming more like a real war, those people aren't going to be around for long because they don't they there's they, you're not going to be able to get the water and the food that you need in that dense right. dense population. So they need to get outside that dense urban area, but then they have right. to. And that that alone isn't sufficient. You have to find like minded people and collaborate and have this collective skill set to survive what's coming. Right. So that's what right. I was interested in. Uh, so in so one of the things of the one of the things we do is we you know uh, we encourage people to look at places where there are already clusters of people doing that, mm. and that's one rather of the than reasons. reinvent the wheel. Right. You you can't you uh, I you know. I, I go back, it starts with people you can trust. Mm -hmm. So you've got to find a place where you know people or you can connect in with people through networks of trust, mm -hmm. you know, where you can quickly go to work with like, like-minded people. And there are, you know, what we, we have something called Solari Connect where you can join and meet up with people in that place. But we regularly talk about what are the places that have those clusters. And of course, right now I'm in Tennessee today and people are pouring into Tennessee because they're, there are a number of different places in Tennessee where you have those clusters. And of course, it's because you have this group of Tennessee legislators who've been working on health and food and financial freedom for years and years and years. You know, and it's it's sort of built, and we're very strong on the Second Amendment, although there's tremendous pressure. I do want to bring up something that is important to understand and is a big, big concern. And that is, if you look at the kinds of people who've been coming across the border for the last three years, mm -hmm. I'm very concerned. I just came from Memphis and I was staying in Germantown, which is a lovely suburb outside of Memphis. The week I was there, Joe, um, 
the night before I got up the morning and, and my host, I was staying with a dear friend, said, uh, last night, 35 cars at the University of Memphis were broken into. Mm-hmm. And there are regular reports of some guy was just, uh, it happened before I got there, he was just driving down Poplar Avenue, which is the main thoroughfare, and somebody shot a bullet. It knocked his glasses off his head, but luckily missed him. And then it popped the window in the back. Luckily, there was nobody in the back seat, or they could have been killed. And um, he's just driving down the street. And and you know, if if you if you and the police literally have instructions to not enforce. It's like San Francisco. So there there are real issues of both organized crime and these teams of mercenaries that appear to be coming across the border. We're, I'm getting reports from subscribers all over the country of teams of young men with new fresh clothes, a new cell phone and backpacks who are clearly military trained. So, um, you know, I think safety is a real issue. And that means you yeah. do need to be in a community outside the big city. You know, you don't need to be in San Francisco. You don't need to be in Chicago. You don't need to be, um, you know, in downtown Memphis. And you you need to get out where there's food and water, but you also need to be around a cluster of people who are savvy about physical security and protecting each other against crime. So how, and, how do you suggest finding these uh, networks of people that exist? So, you so I link on your site or that? right. So I would, if you're a Solari subscriber, I would join connect and find the people in your area and start asking. We have a, a show once a week called ask Catherine and we regularly talk about the places where we know of clusters of people and, and, you know, people are sharing on the website, but the CHD has chapters and, um, and Weston price also has chapters. And I find the Weston price course is focused on food. Mm-hmm. They just got raw milk is now legal in 46 States. Mm. That's a huge, we just celebrated. Iowa was the 46 that came in anyway. So, um, I find a lot of these networks grow up around the fresh food. So um, one of the things I always recommend everybody do, if there's an edible communities magazine in your area, get the e- edible magazine and plug into the Western price and Solari and, and edible communities, you know, sort of network in your place. And while you're looking for that fresh food, you'll start meeting a lot of like-minded people and you can network out from there. I don't know. Do you have a community effort on your website? We don't. And I think that may have been an oversight. Uh, but when I first started this out, I wasn't recognizing that, uh, you know, an imminent collapse was was coming. So, uh, you know, the, the, so as your understanding improves and widens, then you provide the research. But we have not done that effort yet. No. Well, the, the control, if you look at how they control the money at the federal government, it's controlled one county at a time. Mm-hmm. And if you look at what a wealth building reset would look like, it would be a tremendous decentralization and re-engineering of the money. So right now, the economy, um, we have 50% or more of the income in any county in America, the 3,100 counties, goes through the federal government. And it's it has a negative return on investment. It's being spent, invested to get control instead of to encourage productivity. But that could change overnight if for some reason we broke free at the state level and were free to re-engineer the cash flows, the speed at which we could go from negative return to positive return is astonishing. And I think you've seen a lot of the 2016 and 2020 presidential elections where people who want to be productive, who see the destruction, you know, tyranny is hugely destructive of the of productivity and the economic wealth. And of course, you know, back to the food and the nutrition and the health is at the core of that. So if you could turn that around at the local level, that's where the tremendous opportunity is because the current system is very, very destructive of the economy. And so that action is going to have to happen at the local level. But as you do it at the local level, what you're going to do in Tulsa is totally different than what you're going to do in Brooklyn. When I was assistant secretary of housing, and then when I started the um, my investment bank to help re-engineer communities, we simulated how to re-engineer the money by place, bottom up. And of course, you know it's very unique to your place and your skills and your ability and what your geographic and people resources are. So it's going to be very diverse. But you want enormous global 
and domestic communication between networks. So you want local, it, think of it as an optimization. You have a local optimization, but you have a global optimization and you want that communication going back and forth between communities all across the country and the world. That's, you know, think of this as every every country and every county is full of wonderful people who've been going along with a criminal syndicate and it's like a tapeworm and we need to detox the criminal syndicate and go back to productive living. And that's going to be part local and it's going to be part, you know, sort of national or global. It's both. Yeah. And what was the thing I can never do where you rub your stomach and pat your head? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have to do that. <laughs> yeah. With practice, you can just do about anything, you know, your brain's pretty resilient and yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I you know, one of the things, and this is why I love to get people like Michael or Chuck on the Solaria report. When you get, I'm an investment banker. So when the idea of creating fantastic amounts of new wealth gets me very happy and excited, that's just the nature of who I am. And when I first realized it was 1996 that I I had the smartest guy at my company, Hamilton Securities, is a M- MIT PhD, a brilliant guy. And I had him go off and do the simulation of what could happen if we re-optimize just the federal money that was being wasted for control, um, you know, and integrated. And I didn't even begin to know the beginnings of how much new technology there was. And he brought back the simulation and the wealth creation was so enormous. I just, I just thought he was wrong. He had to be wrong. And I said, that's wrong. Just go do it again. And finally, after like three attempts, he came back and said, you're just going to have to take the weekend and go through all of this and figure it out. And because I'm not wrong, I'm right. And I did. I took the whole weekend and I went through all the numbers of what would happen if we re-optimized all the money. And I was stunned. I was just stunned. And I thought, you know, there's no reason for poverty. We have plenty. There's no problem. You know, and ever since then, part of the reason for my optimism is I know economically what could be possible with an advanced civilization. But we have to, you know, we have to stop being primitive. We have to stop being violent. We have to grow up. And, um, you know, all I can tell you is t- tyranny is far more expensive than anybody realizes. Yeah. Well, and that it's possible, too, and that we have to take action. Right. To understand that there is a there is a solution, but it's not going to happen spontaneously. It needs a number of people to take the right steps. And we, we have enough mass now. If, if it's 25, 30 percent that really a population that really understands this, that's more than enough. So they understand that they're dealing with a criminal syndicate and they've got to stop trusting them. Mm-hmm. What they need help with is, OK, what do I do? Right. Because what do I do? There, there hasn't been a, a collective, comprehensive, co- coordinated effort to educate them about that. Right. And that's why with all these pieces, the financial transaction freedom mm-hmm. piece, or I want to stop CBDC or taxation, we're constantly putting in lists of what can I do and saying to people, this is a buffet. Don't do everything on this list. Do the ones you can do and are energizing and feasible for you to do. Because if everybody does that, you know, it's a revolution. Well, so, my view, there's two things that everyone needs to do. One is to find community. And the subset of that is if you're in a big urban area, get out, get out right. soon. Uh, then the second one is to write your state legislator. And if you're in the in a big urban community in a state that isn't like New York or California, you may want to go to a different state and write the state legislator there because the likelihood right. of you turning over California or New York or Illinois or Washington is like zero to none. You know. Right. Well, he- here's the thing. I would say it this way. We, this country, and the most shocking thing to me once I got kicked out of the establishment was I would travel the country and what I would realize is we were supporting the criminals instead of our true leaders. And there are leaders all over the country. So, you know, I just have to brag because I'm in Tennessee. Senator Frank Nicely is one of the greatest politicians alive today. Uh, I can't say enough good things about this man. And sometimes I think he gets frustrated with me because I say too many nice things about him. But You know, this is a man who's been working in the trenches for years for health freedom, food freedom, financial freedom. You know, one tiny piece of legislation, scores and scores of legislation. I'm going to be speaking up. I'm going to speak with him on November 6th. He and and Representative Halsey, another great 
Tennessee legislator are going to be up in Rogersville, thanks to the Tennessee chapter of CHD. And we're going to be talking about what what legislators can do. And it's going to live stream so that all the legislators across the country, mm-hmm. you know, can can be part of a conversation of, OK, how are we going to deal with this? So but, you know, in your county, you have great leaders in your city. You have great leaders in your state legislator. You have great leaders who are doing things for health and food and financial freedom, you've got to identify them and stop giving your energy, you know, whether it's you're in a, in, in you're a bank that's not fighting for your freedom, whether you're in uh, investing in the companies that are poisoning you, you know, go through your balance sheet, go through your wallet, go through everything you're doing, identify the great leaders and stop supporting the people who are trying to kill you and poison you and start supporting the people who are fighting for your freedom. And, you know, and of course, among that, right now, the critical ones are the state legislature and the, and the, and the state officials. You know, we've seen the state AGs bringing great litigation. Mm-hmm. God bless them. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm sure you're following Missouri versus Biden. And now there's a new lawsuit against Meta. But, but you know, find those leaders and support them. I agree. Great, great strategy, great recommendation, because we want to do something to to thwart their efforts to take control and turn and basically in the war they're engaged in to to commit most all of us to slavery. That's their goal. Yes. That's why, you know, people say, aren't you afraid to do what you know? I was like, no, I'm afraid of what happens if you don't, <laughs> if you don't. I mean, I know where this is going to go. And it's funny. I keep telling the C.J. Hopkins once asked me. What's that world going to be like? And I said, you know, CJ, I have no idea. I never thought about it because I know I won't be alive. <laughs> it's you take uh, the, the cyanide pill. Shut down so, complex one. Oh, I won't take the cyanide pill. <laughs> so, so during the swine flu, I don't know if you know this, I was very aggressive early on in swine flu and saying this is genocide mm-hmm. and trying to stop it. And um, finally, when they when they got Massachusetts to mandate it, and I knew they were going to try and come mandate through the states. I called Franklin Sanders, who's a wonderful precious metals dealer in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And he's got a, they have a big farm and, um, and, you know, sell off the farm anyway. So, so I called Franklin and he's got seven kids who all live around him. So they've got a huge compound, you know, perfect example of a community and a beautiful land. And so, um, you know, it's a funny, I used to, you know, I used to always tell people, to try and quickly explain what happened to me with the litigation. I used to tell them, uh, have you seen the movie enemy of the state? I played Will Smith in real life. Um, but when I first saw enemy of the state in, in enemy of the state, you know, Will Smith is a Washington attorney has no idea how covert operations and the intelligence agencies work. And he, he's just completely stupefied and baffled until he finds Gene Hackman, who's a former NSA employee who explains to him about how the world really works. And so, so, you know, the key in life is to find Gene Hackman and mm-hmm. get an understanding of how the control systems work. And you're right. They've been, they've been doing this kind of extraordinary well, surveillance. You are the, you are the Gene Hackman. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I never worked at the intelligence agency, yeah, but, but I will say this. I but gotta, you're exposing them. You are exposing them. Well, but I've had huge experience on the covert side, thanks right. to the litigation that most Americans and you know something? I never believed that the mortgage fraud was as bad as it was rumored to be until that forced me to dig in deeply to the nuts and bolts of how they engineer it. And it was that knowledge that then helped me do the due diligence on crypto. And, and you know, before the litigation, I just couldn't believe it was that bad and I didn't know about it. But, you know, it, and it took going, you have to understand the nuts and bolts of how they do it. Mm-hmm. And, and then you see how it works and then you realize, oh, and of course, the digital technology and surveillance system is at the very heart of of making all these things possible. So, it's a complex web they've spun. About the right. It's a complex like- web, but at the at the at the you know you can step back and look at it and make it simple, which is, you know, it, it's a group of people who want to centralize control. The technology gives them the ability to do it. And, and, you know, the technology is there are many different parts, but you can understand it. You can build a big map of, of what's going on and you can start to decentralize and protect yourself. 
because, you know, if you look at how they operate, it's a numbers game. It's a percentage game. You know, there are tremendous things you can do to disadvantage and slow them down. And, you know, I'll be perfectly blunt. I've said this many times. I think they will fail not because we stop them. I think they will fail because they'll kill each other. And, and well, that's they're why, doing that. You know, yes. most, most of the Democrats are the ones who've adopted the, the jab. Uh, maybe 19 out of 20 took it and they're killing their 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 largest following. You know? Right. Although they're they're bringing in new, you know, lots of new people. And the rumors are they're planning on making them eligible to vote if they can. So, um, yeah. you know, so, so they have a replacement thing going on. But, um, uh, you know, I and that's why it's so important that we pull our resources and our attention and our approval away from them, because, you know, it's it's that energetically, it's that energy that helps them keep going without killing each other. The more we withdraw, mm -hmm. the more they will fight over over the, you know, sort of the positions. They're quite. I, I just think that's why it's so important that we we withdraw and bring transparency. I yeah. always found, you know, I'm a great believer in transparency, but whenever we would publish a headline in the early 2000s about, you know, this amount of money went missing, this amount of money is missing, these mm -hmm. fights would break out. And I realized, oh, you know, they have a problem because if they can't keep the secret, everybody wants a bigger bonus. You know, <laughs> if I if I helped you steal 59 billion out of HUD and I only got a little bonus, I realized, wait a minute, you're getting 59 billion. I want more. Yeah. So these every time we would bring out these headlines, these fights would break out. It was quite wonderful. And I realized, <laughs> oh, we called it. There's a wonderful story in the Bible, the Gideon, uh, Gideon's army, which I love and judges. And um, and in the in Gideon, the Midianites have occupied Israel and and Gideon's army sort of brings vibration and light down upon them. And the Midianites jump up in the dark and kill each other. <laughs> and that's my my vision of it's a great, great metaphor for sure. Yeah, the Midian. I think the Midianites are going to kill each other. So, it's so a good we possibility. Just, I mean, yeah, in some ways they're doing it already, but uh, we, I think we can accelerate that by following your suggestions, getting to our own communities, being sovereign uh, and independent, and let them let them have at it. I mean, right. you, you do not want to stay in the cities and fight with these people at all. No, no, work. no, no. It's very dangerous. It's yeah. very dangerous. What I want is I want everybody to get your confidence that they can do it. That's what I want. That's a good point. You know, I haven't really reflected on it, but I probably should meditate on that and see if, what the underlying theme is and then come up with a recommendation because you do need the confidence. I mean, you you need rock right. solid, bulletproof confidence that, that, is, that you're un, unwavering and, and you can get that. I don't think it's that hard to do. It, it's just that you have to be certain of what, what the, and you know, with that certainty may require a lot of reading or listening. Well, to but I, I think part of it is you built a successful business doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You made it yeah. economically feasible. It wasn't just something you do on the weekends. You no, that, do it all that, the time. That's a good right. point. You know, and really one of the major advantages I had during the COVID pandemic is that most of the physicians who were in this bind, I mean, they were most right. physicians are employees. People understand that they don't have their own business. Right. So they're they're slaves in respect to the system. Otherwise, they they get terminated and they don't have a job. It happened to Paul Merrick, right. it happened to Peter McCullough. Uh, it, it happened to Pierre Corey. So right. the, you know, I I didn't wasn't that prescient to realize that that was a possibility. I just knew that I could help more people by leveraging myself on the Internet. It had right. the, the unintended consequences of making me independent of their system. So, so that here's what happened to me in um, in when I got kicked out of the establishment and I decided I was going to fight. I turned to my attorney, the Carolyn Betts, who does financial rebellion with me, and I said, Carolyn, because all my life, I'd been a successful investment banker that worked for big governments and big corporations. And, you know, I swung around billions of dollars. I didn't I didn't know how to help somebody as an investment advisor. And I, I turned to Carol and I said, we're going to have to find a way to support ourselves at retail, you know, because we have to work for the people we're trying to protect instead of work for the big governments and corporations. And Carol turned to me and she said, good luck with that, honey. <laughs> And it took me 10 years to figure out how I, you know, and I just had to live on fumes for 10 years while we figured out, okay, how can we build a business serving people that is economic for the people and economic for us? 
And once we did, then we felt free, you know, because I wanted to be free to tell people what I really believed. Mm -hmm. I, I just had to have that. And anyway, so, so, you know, and, and occasionally it's funny, the, the worst hacking we would get was on pharmaceutical stuff. And whenever I would put something that was very critical of the pharmaceutical industry, I would think, well, can I afford $5,000 worth of hacking? To, you know, is that worth it for this article? But anyway, but I felt very free. And in the beginning of COVID, I felt very free because I was working for the people I was trying to protect. And I think, I think what I could recommend to everyone is if you're in a job where you're working for a large corporation, a large government, start to look at different ways you can do more for yourself, you know, build household resiliency by providing, uh, you know, your own energy or your own gardens or other things that permanently lower your expenses and protect you against inflation. But how can you start building skills or lines of income outside of big corporations and governments where you can have that financial confidence to know that you're you're part of the solution because you're being paid by the people you're serving that you're trying to protect and get out of that financial conflict of interest in your job if you can. And that's going to be essential. I, yeah. I think that you, absolutely. There's no question about it, but it will also help in the community that you eventually decide to join because right. everyone, ideally everyone should have some skill set that they can contribute to the community. It's not like you're, right. you're, you're leeching off of the people there. You want to serve them too. So it's, it's a mutually beneficial arrangement. So you, you right. have to, ideally you have a skill set that can help a lot of people. And then you could sell that in the meantime, but before that, well, you could be in the community too, but Bef uh, but it would help you with your comp building your confidence because you have this uh, accessory source of income that would allow you to separate from the traditional system. Well, it was really funny because when it all started, when the litigation started, people would ask me questions. And I had very terrible experiences with the New York Times and Washington Post that I just decided I'm not going to talk to media. I'm going to have people email. So I'd give out my email address. And then I would get questions and I would just answer the questions and the questions grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And then finally I realized people want me to be an investment advisor. So I registered as an investment advisor. And then my clients would ask me the same 50 questions. You know, I'd get the same question 50 times in a week. And I said, wait a minute, I can't, I've got to batch this. And that's when we started the Solera report just to answer all the questions and then I started a screen company to do screening because people were asking me to screen equities for them. And it all evolved into two businesses. I never wrote a business plan. I just kept answering questions. <laughs> That's the way and, it should be. And well, here's what was interesting. For the first, I don't know, from, two, from 1999 when I did the first radio show until 2007 when I registered, you know, I just answered the questions for free. Mm -hmm. I, it wasn't a business. I was just answering questions and trying to survive. And then, then it evolved into a business. I had to get to a certain level of performance where I could justify charging money for it. You know, there had to be this learning curve. And that's why I always tell people who are looking to get out of the corporate world, just look around and see who's asking you for help and just help them and mm -hmm. see where it goes. Because because it's by having that serving, you know, you said you wanted to be a doctor because you wanted to help people. It's by serving other people and continuing to serve them and getting, you know, highly smart and productive at serving them that you find out where you add value mm -hmm. and where, where they will support you. And it's at that, it's at that point where you're really serving people in a way that addresses where we need to go as a society you know, that's where you find the sweet spot. And I think some of your confidence comes from the fact that you've done that. Mm -hmm. And we all need to do that. So uh, I, I, I would, uh, you know, you can't, you can't walk away from institutions or people that do not have integrity fast enough. You know, and as you learn, some of them will boot you out. Substitute walk to run away. <laughs> right. Right. Run. right. Like instantaneously accelerate. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Cause it's just, and, and your community too, you, you, you have to, just because a person a community may have some similar views, there can be people in there who don't have integrity and, and it really, so you have to vet your community. It's just not, right. you know, it's not all going to be a hundred percent. So. Right. And the hardest thing for me is people who had integrity three years ago, suddenly are letting me down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's part of going through this change people who, who try to have integrity 
are put under extreme pressure, you know, whether they have problems with their health or problems with their business. So, you know, integrity is a struggle in this environment. It's, you know, it's, we're in a war and the friction of war is high. It's going to, and I think, you know, whether Whitney's right in her timing or not, it's going to get, it's going to get much, much worse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing too, is it, you know, once you, it, 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 once you evolve spiritually to a point, and I'm not suggesting I'm there yet, but you know, this is a temporary shell. We're not here forever. You know, right. We're going to move on so at some point. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the worst, the worst they can do is kill you, you know? It's, it's, right. It's not, and that's not the worst thing that could happen. Right. right. Uh, absolutely. Right. I mean, right. Ostensibly that's what most people believe is that they can kill you. No, it'd be, it'd be worse right. to be a slave in permanent pain. One of my, you know, I love, I don't know if you've ever read Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my favorite books, but there's a great line from Gladiator quoting Marcus Aurelius. He says, death, death smiles at all, death smiles at us all. All a man can do is smile back. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. And that, you know, it's funny because the uh, I studied spiritual warfare during the litigation. It really saved my life. And um and I still practice it, although I find it much harder since the COVID started. And I don't know whether it's the injections, but there's a real deterioration in the field. And it's much, it's sort of much higher to get back into the divine mind. I find myself spending more and more time trying to get back. But um, I, I do think at the root, it's a spiritual battle. And mm -hmm. spiritual tools are essential to deal with it. But when I, you know, I've been through all these situations where it's impossible that I'm alive. It's just impossible that I'm alive and yet I'm alive. And I've started to come to realize, you know, miracles, you know, miracles are part of our existence. And 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 the invisible realities are very different than we we realize. I'm reading a wonderful book. I don't know if I'm a huge Ingo Swan fan. Have you ever read Ingo Swan? No, I never heard of him. Really? He was no. the top remote viewer in the in the government program oh. to do remote viewing. But he was some people say he was another Da Vinci. He he wrote a great deal. And he um Nick Cook, the the British journalist, after Swan died, he had a lot of unpublished manuscripts. And the family invited Nick to take two of the manuscripts and publish it. And it's called Resurrecting the Mysterious, where Ingo Swan tries to map out invisible reality. Mm -hmm. And give you a framework for invisible reality, and it's um, you know, it doesn't come at it so much from a spiritual point of view, but the point of view of a remote viewer, um, but really a remarkable person. And um, and I think, you know, back to spiritual warfare, you need to have an understanding and a framework for the invisible realms because they're very present, they're very much at work. Um, I think AI is going to give access to essentially interdimensional forces. And of course, the question is, will they be the forces of love or the forces of evil? You know, so this kind of powerful technology ups our game tremendously in the spiritual realms. All very exciting, I think so. But, but, <laughs> but, but exciting, but at the same time, it gives it incumbent upon us to have responsibilities you know, we've been given a lot in this in this world. M most of us watching this, right? Even if it doesn't seem like it, we really have. When you compare it to other places in the world, would you like to be a Palestinian in Gaza at this time? Not really, right? So, you know, we have a lot, and there are things that we can do. Simple things, simple right. things that can make a profoundly big difference. So, right, that's a responsibility, and you know, to become independent and get into community and resist this impending tyranny can be a a really powerful effort that each and every one of us can take. Right. To do that, you need to have the impulse to understand that you're important. And, and by taking responsibility for a problem, you have the, you know, that's how you get power. So to solve a problem, you, you need power and you get the power by saying, this is my problem. I take responsibility for it. And I'm going to find a way to use my time to help other people deal with this and and myself, my family, et cetera. But it starts with that impulse to take responsibility. And that's one of, you know, one of my concerns is it's very easy to get frustrated, to go to anger. Mm -hmm. And we're encouraged to believe we're victims. And of course, that's what causes you to lose your power. 
And the greatest power comes from love. And if Mm -hmm. you get frustrated and angry, you lose your love and you can't, that's, you know, taking responsibility, but, but coming at things with love, that's where we have the ability to access the higher mind. And that's where real solutions come. I mean, it's funny. One of the ways I learned healthcare was when I couldn't afford to go to the doctor and it was too dangerous politically to go to a doctor or hospital. I would just go in prayer. You know, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And I tried every old timey recipe you can find or think of, but it was through prayer that I would know what to try next. And I was shocked and amazed it worked. Yeah, it's absolutely. It absolutely work. You just ask for help and help arrives. Yeah. So um, it's important to know there's never, 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 never any justification to be angry. Just isn't. I know that, but I. I, And uh, the the solution is what you said. The solution is love and forgiveness. Right. Right. So. Right. But I, you know, something I say that and I know that, but I can't tell you how many times a week I fail. (laughs) <laughs> okay, that, and of then, course you, I catch myself. then you've got to forgive yourself instantly. Yeah. So that's yeah. the thing. Because that the most important person to forgive is you. Yes. For sure. Because yes. we all screwing up all the time. So that that's key. well in the in the um in the in the book of Revelations, which I never quite understood, it says in the in the last days the spirit of offense will rise mm-hmm. and people will take or give offense much faster. And that's exactly what we're watching happening as I'm traveling across. I'm driving across America right now, and I'll be uh, through Tennessee down to Georgia, then back up to mm-hmm. um, Pennsylvania. The speed at which people give or take offense is shocking. <laughs> it's shock. No, it's shocking. It's unbelievable. So that's why you know we we must maintain our state of amusement. So that's my goal: is to stay in a state of amusement all the time. Yeah, but no. I've I've yet to do it perfectly for a week. But I'm. I'm optimistic You're I trying. can do it. Keep on trying. trying. Just forgive yourself when you don't. That's all. <laughs> Simple strategy. Yeah. Uh, what a delight, Catherine. It's just been really great. Uh, giving us so much valuable information, powerful information that we can implement and take action on and actually make a difference in this, in the warfare that we're engaged in, even if we don't know it. Well, so, I so, you know, I so appreciate you. And I appreciated you long before we did that Bitcoin interview, but that was something... That was the first time anybody ever let let the discussion go through all the different issues. You know, it was a long, I think you said it was the longest one you'd ever done, but oh, you really, be. you really dug in and went through everything. And I think it was just an incredible contribution to the conversation. And I think, yeah, wow. Some, in some ways, it was like Joe Rogan giving Bobby Kennedy the platform for three hours, which interestingly in his entire career, no one ever gave him a three hour platform to discuss his position on vaccines. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So that's yeah, what that we, was we, great. We these, these conversations and, yeah. uh, and ultimately you turned out to be spot on, as we mentioned earlier, is that. Uh, so yeah. one conversation I would love to have to you, you know, I wrote that paper for the presidential uh, candidates, okay. but I would love to go through that with you sometime and talk about, okay, if you're walking into the Oval Office, what are you facing? What do you do? And uh, and I'll I'll send you a link to it. But that would be that's that needs to be a three hour conversation. <laughs> it's but, not a short know, it's one. Not, but none of us are going to be walking into the Oval Office. And you know, my concern with any national level politician is that it's a dangerous path to go down because there is I don't, Bobby right. Kennedy included. There is no political savior. Right. There just isn't. There can be local saviors that can be part of the solution, like this developing this a state bank. Powerful, powerful right. strategy. If you if you but I go back to this, you know, the the rubbing your stomach and patting your head at the yeah. same time. If you have the state legislators moving to do all of this, it matters at the top. It, it matters at the top. Okay. It matters who's at the Treasury. It matters who at the who's in the Fed. It matters who's in Congress. You know, it doesn't take but a few people to make a huge difference. All right. Well, I'm sure you can convince and, me. You can miss me a lot of things. <laughs> I, I, I become really disenamored with the. Well, here's the thing. There's nothing office. you can do in the Oval Office if that infrastructure is not rising, because yeah, yeah. So we the, need to decentralize power and pull it down and do it in a way that's wealth building. If that isn't there, then they have nothing. It's like a, it's a, a surfer with no wave. This is exactly what the founding fathers of this country had. That was right. their model. That was their model. Yes. We we bastardized it on, on spades. Right. 
but it is there to be done. Yeah. It's always there to be done. There's no, when you have a negative return on investment, everything is losing, losing, losing. All you have to do is re-engineer to a positive and then you're gaining, gaining, gaining. At the root, it, it you know, I'm not saying that it's easy as a human change, but it, as a financial and economic change, if you change the model, you know, you're going in the positive direction. It, it's there to be done. Yeah. It's right. exciting. Well, we'll have to uh, have you back and have that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, be well. And thank you again for everything you do. And thank you again for the opportunity to be in cahoots with you. All right. You take care. And we'll be, we'll have you back at some point. Thanks so much for watching. Remember, hit the like and subscribe button so you can get more videos that can help you and your family take control of your health.